Good afternoon, and welcome to the Voices from the Field Leadership Series. My name is Erica Walker, and I'm a third year doctoral student within the Department of Environmental Health here at Harvard School of Public Health. I am also a self-proclaimed comic book fanatic because nothing motivates me more than a great hero's tale. Today, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you a real life superheroine, Lois Gibbs, an environmental activist whose work spans over the past 35 years. At the beginning of her journey, she was a housewife living in a neighborhood called Love Canal with a young child who attended an elementary school built on a toxic chemical dump site. She had a powerful belief that, and I quote from her book, Love Canal, the story continues, ordinary citizens using tools of dignity, self-respect, common sense, and perseverance can influence solutions to important problems in our society. As a result of her work in organizing, President Carter signed new federal legislation called Superfund to address thousands of other toxic sites across the nation, making Lois the de facto mother of the Superfund. Since then, Lois has gone on to create the Center for Health, Environment, and Justice to address public health and environmental threats from chemical hazards. She has authored several books, holds five honorary PhDs, and has received a nomination for the Nobel Peace Prize. As I turn this session over to Professor Doug Dockery, who will be moderating today, please join me in welcoming Lois Gibbs to the Voices from the Field Leadership Series at Harvard School of Public Health. Erica, thanks. Thanks for the very nice introduction. And welcome to everyone here for this Voices uh, from the Field on Decision-Making uh, series that we have here at the Harvard School of Public Health to really bring forward the leaders in government and health and uh, public agencies who've been dealing with these types of issues of leadership. So we're very pleased to have Lois Gibbs here today. And as, you, as Erica introduced her, we, she has an extraordinary career, uh, starting with her experiences as a, a mother and a community organizer in Love Canal, and uh, leading to a organization, the Center for Health and Environment and Justice, uh, which is teaching leadership uh, in the community. And we're very pleased to have her here. Uh, we hope we're very pleased to have the audience here of students and faculty members and researchers from the Harvard School of Public Health and sharing this with people worldwide through the World Wide Web. And we're looking forward to your questions uh, later on and hope you'll prepare some interesting questions for Lois to uh, continue the discussion. Uh, I'd just like to point out this session is being co-sponsored by our Center for uh, Outreach and Community Engagement which is part of our Superfund project. <laughs> and uh, we're very honored to have you here as part of that effort also. So Lois, it's been, uh, as Erica said, 35 years. We celebrated 35 year anniversary of Love Canal uh, last year. And you've gone through an amazing journey from a uh, concerned mother to being an international leader here. Um, tell us a little bit about that journey for you. I mean, what was, what were the big turning points for you? What were the uh, lessons you've learned in terms of taking on the community and leadership? Well, I have to begin by saying I'm an accidental leader. Mm -hmm. I didn't intend to be a leader. Um, I intended to be a mother mm -hmm. and the best mother possible mm -hmm. and a good wife. And I think they call them domestic engineers today. Mm -hmm. um, and I became a leader because circumstances forced me to do so. Um, and, and I think, that, I think mm. that what that says, because I've been very successful at being mm. a leader, mm. is that anybody can do it. I mean, I have a high school education. Mm -hmm. And when I first found out about the toxic site and found out my children were likely sick from that toxic site, I went to my local government, my city hall, the, the county health department and said, my son is sick and there's 20,000 tons of chemicals. I think these things are connected and I want to move out of that school. And, and my first lesson I learned is that government doesn't work the way it was supposed mm -hmm. to. And, and I know a lot of people know that and think that, but these, the things that I experienced at that core level was about crushing my whole belief in the 
government system of the United States of America. I mean, popping that bubble, and that was so hard to do, and it's hard to do now. And when your students and other people go out into the workplace and they believe it's going to be one way, and then you find out it's another way, it's really hard to get your arms around. So, one of the first lessons I learned is that Lois Gibbs does not matter. In the eyes of government, in the eyes of the health authorities. That Lois Gibbs was a working class mom with sickly children and essentially could be dismissed. She's not adding anything to society because society looks at issues in the sense of dollars and cents and benefits. And what did Lois mm -hmm. Gibbs benefit in society? Well, I think I could benefit society a lot. I was Cub Scout leader. I went to the PTA. I mean, that, that was my society. Those, those things have to happen in the community. And, and so that was a rude awakening to me when, um, when I learned that I don't matter. Because I always thought if you played by the rules, you behaved yourself, you paid your taxes, you went to church, you did all the things you were supposed to do, that you would matter. And, and today, across this country in many different social um, settings, you have that same dynamic playing out. The second thing I learned is if you play by the rules, it doesn't matter either. This is really dis depressing, isn't it? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but so, so what they said is, well, you want to move your kid, then here are the, the things you have to jump through. Here are the hoops. You have mm -hmm. to go to your pediatrician. You have to get these notes. You have to do this. You have to do that, all of which I did and then took it to the authorities and said, okay, you told me to get this relief. I needed to do these seven things. I did these seven things, so give me the relief I'm looking for. And they said, no, because Lois Gibbs doesn't matter. If, if they do it for Lois Gibbs, they have to do it for um, 407 children who attend the school because I wanted my son moved from the school. Just This is my first understanding of how society worked. I, I guess I lived a very protective mm -hmm. life. And, and he said, no. And then I cried. And I think that when people begin to enter leadership, there are all these things that you didn't understand and you don't know what to do with it. What do you do with that? H how do you move forward when they said, here are the rules, obey the rules, do these things, and you will, you will get relief, and you don't. And I just sat there and cried and said, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? So what transformed you? Well, first of all, I have to admit proudly that I'm Irish, <laughs> and Irish have tempers. <laughs> and so I got really angry at this man. <laughs> and what I decided is, okay, if you're not going to help me, then I have to figure out somebody who will. And, and the, the second part of it was really about having the passion to fix this problem and then the courage. Um, leadership takes courage. You have to step out of your comfort zone. Mm. And, and I had already done that to a certain extent in the first phases, but I had to do more. So what I decided to do was to talk to my neighbors. Maybe somebody in my neighborhood knows what to do. And, and this is why I call myself an accidental leader. Mm. So I put together a petition to go door to door. Now, most people think putting together a petition is an easy thing to do, and you can just knock on doors, and it's a little scary. It was terrifying. It was absolutely terrifying. Mm -hmm. I have my petition, and I go to the very first door, and I knock on the very first door so lightly their dog didn't bark, and I ran all the <laughs> way home. <laughs> because it was terrifying, because you know, to be a leader, to, to grow into this position, I didn't go to class to learn this. I grew into it by mm. my own personal experiences. But uh, long story short, I went back to that door with that same petition and knocked hard enough that the dog did bark and somebody answered the door. And what really turned the point for me was at one of these doors, it was not the first door, but at one of these doors, someone said to me, I've been waiting for somebody to come and knock on my door and tell me what to do. And I'm like, but I'm here to ask you what to do. <laughs> I yeah. don't know what to do. But, but what, what, a real, what I realize is that there are a lot of people who can make a lot of change and take leadership positions, um, like myself. And what they need is the encouragement to do so. 
That woman who said that knocked on doors the next day with me mm. and learned how to do it and overcame her, her shyness, her nervousness. And, and so building a team together, moving forward together, supporting one another, giggling with each other or, or making fun of the last house we were at. I mean, there was mm. lots of different things happening. But, but those, were, those were really turning points for me, and especially the one that said... I've been looking for somebody to tell me what to do. I've been looking for somebody to knock on my door. And I think if you're in a workplace or if you're in a, uh, a public place and, and working on issues, the people you're trying to reach are people just like that woman. They don't know what to do, but with a little leadership and guidance, they can move and they will move with you. And, and that's what I realized. And so we set up the the local homeowners association and and began to organize. I think the second lesson, unless you want to ask me another question. No, you're on a roll here. Go. <laughs> okay. So I think the second lesson I learned is a good leader does nothing. Hmm. A good leader builds other leaders. So you don't have to. You you often hear people say, um, you know, I do everything in the office, or I do everything in this mm. community group, or I do it. Nobody else is doing anything. I'm taking on the responsibilities. Well, that's your fault because you're not a good leader. A good leader is a leader who provides vision, hope, support, and voice. And in voice, I don't mean my voice or the leader's voice, but facilitates the opportunity for people to come together. You may know the answer to the question, how do we move forward from here to there? You could say, I know how to do that. We just do this, this, and this. That's a bad leader because people are then following directions. They're not learning the different things they need to learn along the way. So instead, I always facilitated a conversation and said, okay, this is not moving forward. This opponent refuses to move. How do we move forward? And we would have a conversation, and we had a conversation sometimes with 500 people in the room, but it was well organized and, and, um, and controlled. You know, how do we do this? And people are brilliant, and they came up with absolutely brilliant ideas. I would have said, do this, and we actually ended up doing that. But because people owned it, because they, they had a conversation, they understood why are we moving in this direction? Why are we doing this? That as a leader, I could bring people along and they wanted to be there. They, they, they were part of it. They were part of the organization. They were part of the team about how are we going to make this happen? And, and I think that's really important. Often leaders, whether you're supervising, supervising people or running a community organization, are just, it's easier just to say what to do. And, and bring people along, but people don't stay with you. People, people walk away at some point because they're not invested in it. And so at Love Canal, the honest to goodness truth is that I never made a decision. I never, well, maybe paper clips, but beyond <laughs> those minor sort of mechanical decisions, I never made a decision. Instead, I facilitate it, and this is what we teach in our leadership classes, I facilitated people having a conversation, understanding the pros, the cons, doing a democratic vote, you know, the majority wins, um, not consensus, and moving forward. And the organizations, such as the Love Canal Homeowner Association, and many more since then, because we've worked with 12,000 groups since, have, who use that method, have had long-lasting democratically run successful organizations. So how did you get, you had to go forward against the industry, the state officials, the U.S. government, I mean ultimately the president. Where, where did you get the courage to stand up to all these other agencies who were arrayed against you? Well, courage was really hard for me because <laughs> I was really shy. <laughs> Um, and certainly the President of the United mm. States. But um, it, it wasn't so much about courage as trying to figure out the puzzle. So, so we spent a lot of time figuring out who is responsible for this in the sense of who can give us relief. We already knew who was responsible. 
but who can give us the relief we need and what would make them do that and nine out of ten times it was political decision nine out of ten times most decisions in this country whether it's the affordable care act or something it's a political decision which was really hard for us too because we demonstrate it clearly demonstrate it that as an example fifty six percent of our children were born with birth defects fifty six percent of our children had three ears double rows of teeth extra fingers extra toes or were mentally retarded we demonstrated that with hospital records it was undeniable and we thought that then the health department the new york state public health department would give us relief which is evacuation is what we were asking for and instead they came back and said we agree fifty six percent of the kids in this community were born with birth defects however we don't believe that it's related to the love canal dump site with twenty thousand tons of chemicals in it we said well what do you think it is related to we believe it's related to a random clustering of genetically defective people mm -hmm. and anybody who took stats could come up with that i mean it is a possibility not likely but it is a possibility and so so what you end up doing in so many of these environmental and public health uh, debates is you have these dueling experts i mean we see it today for example if you look at climate change there 97 percent of the reports on climate change says the climate is changing and not in a good way. 3% of the report says it is not. All of the opponents latch on to the 3% of the reports and say, here's the evidence it is not, and ignore the 97%. And, and so what we learned was that we could not fight it scientifically because that 3%, using the climate change example, has all the resources. They are the ones who have huge vested interest in the outcome. And at Love Canal, the New York State Health Department, had a huge vested interest in the outcome. If they were to admit 56% of the children were born birth defected as a result of chemical contamination, then they would have to give money to fix the problem. It's a revenue issue. It was millions of dollars, and they weren't going to do it. And so in almost all of these fights, they were political fights so we had to organize politically and and so we developed those skills and how we developed them was because we didn't have school um, we developed them by looking at governor Hugh Carey he was the governor at the time and when there was a press conference or, or a meeting and somebody shouted out something like my child is sick what are you going to do about a governor how did he react we actually looked at these old tapes on TV we put our our VHS, I don't know if the kids today know what those are, but VHS tapes <laughs> in, and looked at him, and we, we paid attention and we saw certain things we would say would make him twitch. You know, just not much, not much, but he would twitch. And so we decided all the twitches, we called it the twitch strategy. <laughs> all the twitches was what he didn't want to hear. So those are the voices that we are going to rise up. We're going to do press releases, we're going to do press conferences, we're going to do um, walks of concern with our religious leaders. We're going to do all these different things, and we're going to only talk about the things that made the governor twitch. And as a result, the governor came and started acting on our behalf. And then we're like, this is not how it's supposed to work, right? What you're supposed to have is a problem. You, you, you demonstrate the problem, and government comes in and fixes it, because that's what our taxes are for. And actually, it's a twitch. If people have to pay attention to the twitch. And, and so we learned how to fight these various opponents at all levels, including the federal level. Um, yeah, Bill Riley had a toe thing, so his toe would just tap when he didn't want to hear something. That was all. Just one toe, left foot, would tap. And, and so, so it was about good leaders are observant. Um, good leaders are not only observant, but they think think outside the box. I mean, most people would say, let's do some polling or let's do some focus groups or let, you know, no, you think out of the box. I mean, that's what we do here, though. As a research institution, we're trying to gather data, 
devise strategies, think about the science, think about what the evidence is and, and develop evidence-based interventions. And, but the reality is, at least to, to get action the way you see it, it's do we play a role in informing these decisions? <laughs> yes, you all have a role here. <laughs> Please continue with your school. Um, it's, it's not that the science isn't hmm. important. The science actually is critically important mm -hmm. because if you're going to raise your voices because the governor t twitches here, how, how do you make the case to the public? If you're going to move a public body to write letters or do something to the governor or the public figure, you need the public involved. Well, the public mm -hmm. isn't going to get involved just because a mom is standing there with a baby in her arms crying, to problem, problem, problem. It was the studies that said 56% of the children were birth mm -hmm. defective, which was done independent of the government. It was done through a university and Roswell, uh, a cancer institute, uh, research institute in Buffalo, that raised that flag. And that was key for us to not only um, show that we're, we're, we have a problem, but it was key to show the public that mm -hmm. those in power are ignoring these families who have this type of problem. And so the science is, it's critically important. It's also some, the messaging. There's a difference in the way the scientists as Roswell presented that evidence as you know we saw at relative odds of such and such, which was statistically significant, although it could be explained by biases and confounding and so forth. But uh, how you craft that message, how you deliver that message, becomes incredibly important. And, yeah, you know. and I think it's really important for folks who are going to do this in the future is to really look at crafting that message. Because I, I read science reports all the time and they actually kind of make me dizzy mm -hmm. because there's, it's not written for the lay audience. Mm -hmm. And so you do your science report, other scientists read it, and the lay audience doesn't because mm -hmm. they can't. It's just not friendly. Um, and to, I mean, I think it's the second part of doing the research is making it lay audience friendly so it's usable. But the, but the other part of it is also, if you're doing that research in those reports, you have to have tough skin. You have to have courage. You have to be a leader to support other leaders. So in the case of our study, Dr. Beverly Pagan was an extraordinary leader. And she would go up to Albany, New York and sit with the health department and explain her data and explain that her data had a lot of limitations to it because mm -hmm. it was done in a different way than New York State could possibly do it with all their resources. But she was willing to do that. So I'll tell you a quick story. So she goes to Albany, she sits down with um, David Axelrod, who was the Commissioner of Health at the time, sits down with David, explains all this stuff, and Dr. Viana, who was the epidemiologist, which I'm really proud I can say now, <laughs> that was a really struggle. Um, and. And they said, okay, we're going to really look at your data, mm -hmm. we're going to test your hypotheses, so forth and so on. She gets off the airplane in Buffalo, picks up the Buffalo newspaper, and the headline says, Albany believes there's nothing wrong at Love Canal, the data that Beverly had was flawed. So mm -hmm. while she was flying back to Buffalo, the health department was doing a press conference to say her data was useless. And, and so Beverly, to her credit, working with us, um, we had an immediate press conference right there at the Buffalo Airport. We called the local media hmm. and we did the counter to that saying, you know, we understand this is what happened. But I think, I think you have to understand who your opponent is no matter who you're working with, whether it's, you know, Beverly worked for the state of New York, the Department of Health. Roswell is a public institution um, hmm. under the, the state uh, health department. And so, you know, she was going up against her boss. So there are many times in which you're going to be put in a position if you decide to take leadership, is you need that courage and you need to come up against your boss to say, this is just not right and you can't move forward. I think the other thing about the, the science stuff is that often, often what's missing in the science is people. So if you were to look at uh, many, many cases we work on, they do risk analysis and they right. figure out, right, um, what the risk is, how many people are going to get X and over a lifetime and so forth. And, and yet they don't look at the people. 
So, so there in this society, there is a decision. It's not written down, but it's a decision that's been made that people who are poor, people who are working poor, which is what the Love Canal community was, or people of color are not worth as much as wealthy white people or middle class white people. Mm -hmm. And so a risk assessment done in a poor black community in Mississippi says that they can be exposed to way more chemicals than if that same risk assessment was done in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And, and it's not about people. It's not about, um, it's not about who's being sacrificed. It's, not, you know, it's, it's, it's based on economics. It's based on dollars and cents. Um, and I personally feel it's ethically wrong. Who gets to decide because they're poor, or in our case, because we're working poor? Who gets to decide that we can be sacrificed because government doesn't want to spend the money to fix the problem? The corporation who is responsible doesn't want to spend the money to fix the problem. Who gets to decide who lives and dies? And that's, that's fundamentally what they were trying to do, not only at Love Canal, but they tried to do across the country, and they try to do in many of the products we buy today. They know many of these products are a problem, and they know people are going to get sick, but they don't care, and nobody's making them care, them being both government and industry. And I think the fundamental ethical question and every city and every state and every community deals with this. Where do we put the incinerator? Bloomberg was good at this. Bloomberg says, where do we put the incinerator in New York City? And the answer was the Navy Yard, because there's poor people there. And there was a fight, and there was great leadership there and a great local effort. And then Bloomberg came back and said, look, I'm not putting it in Madison Avenue. And I don't think he should have put it in either place. But that's the other part of the problem is that fundamentally we look at either or as opposed to the, what is the alternative? Do we need mm -hmm. an incinerator at all? You know, government and industry love to buy these big white elephants. Mm -hmm. and, and those are the solutions. And so where are we going to put this big white elephant? If you look at doing something else, for example, recycling, because everybody understands that, you're really looking at a multifaceted octopus kind of complex system and they don't like that one big machine is way better put it in the poor community and let it let it go that's morally wrong because in these communities folks already deal with poverty they deal with lack of health care lack of proper food lack of a good education and then you put chemicals on top of that these children growing up in these communities almost never have a chance to get out of that circle of poverty because their learning is is crippled because of the chemicals and the added to the other um, elements of, of poverty. And so they can't grow, they can't prosper, they can't reach their potential. And in fact, it goes downward. And so you continue to have the circle of poverty. And you continue to have those locations where that poverty is, is a location where nasty stuff goes, whatever that nasty stuff is. So oftentimes what you're talking about is going beyond the policies, the regulations, the, the laws that are being passed, and really bringing this down to the, the personal level and the, the community level. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you, are you also influencing national policies, and how do we translate this experience into uh, influencing Congress, for example, or uh, the international regulations? Uh -huh. I mean, we see this push for evidence-based regulations, mm -hmm. sound science. Um, at times it sounds like it's more <laughs> trying to put a, a uh, cloak up here, a screen to hide what's actually going on in the background. Right. And right. How, how do you translate, as Tip O'Neill said, all politics is local and you know these environmental problems are local, but how do we translate that into national perspectives? Well, that's a good question, and I think that's building more leaders is the, mm. is the quick and dirty answer. Mm. Um, I think Love Canal demonstrates mm. the power Indeed. of people. Mm -hmm. You know, that Love Canal is not about toxics only and health only. 
it showed that 500 ordinary people, most with a high school or less education, not only could fix their problem, but they woke up a nation to the problems of toxics and environment and public health. And as a result of that, it passed many laws. And, and, and it's the bottom up. I think when you look back at the climate change issue that's been going on, they kept on trying to do it from the top down. You know, they were exactly. all very bright people. Mm -hmm. um, and they were right people for the most part, but they had no base. And because they don't have any base, and Tip O'Neill is right, if we can organize, I always said, if we can organize churches, schools, um, in, in every community, in hospitals, churches, schools, and hospitals in every community, get them to agree with us on something, whatever it is, we've got the whole country. We've got the whole country. Because you can move things up. You look at recycling, when you thought recycling used to be this hippie thing, right? And now everybody's doing it because it's become financially better because of pressure at the grassroots. Now if somebody throws a plastic bottle into the roadway, people look at them like, what is wrong with you? Um, you know, so, so almost all of our policies have come from the base up. You look at pesticide policies, you look at so much of it. So you want to change the world, you start in communities and you link those communities together and you can change the world. And that's actually happening on, on the issue that's current, which is hydrofracking, which is um, oil and gas um, extraction, in which communities all across the country are working in independent of the, at the federal level and really pushing from ch for change from the bottom. And I think we're going to see some resolution to that relatively soon. Good. Uh, this has been fascinating. Let me ask if there's questions from the audience. <laughs> I have a question in the back there. Yeah. Um, so my name is Zach Neider. I'm a second year master's student at the, within the health policy and management track. And my question is related to a sort of grassroots leadership and messaging and thinking about um, you know, what, how communication channels have changed over the last 30 years and whether the Love Canal story would have been easier today if it had been occurring than, than it was back then. You know, would it have been easier to blog about the issue or it, basically how my, I guess my question is, do you feel that grassroots leadership is easier because of the technology changes we've seen over the last, let's say, 15 years, or is it, or is it harder because there's so much noise out there, there's so many competing voices, there's, as you talked about, the 3% who now can find evidence somewhere to back up their, their point of view. So wh what are your opinions, I guess, on grassroots leadership and technology and communication? I think technology is a double edge. I think it's definitely easier to get the message out. I was on a conference call last night with 400 people from every state practically in the country looking at stopping uh, liquid natural gas terminals and export. Um, that was great. We could all share. We could have a conversation. We were all in a, learning the same thing at the same time. In a community setting, it's, it's sometimes the sword um, because people depend on Facebook to get people to the meetings. So they're not knocking on doors. Community organizing is about people talking to people and bringing people together and having these conversations. And you have conversations on Facebook, but they're not at the same level. Um, and so I, it, it's a double-edged sword. I think it's more, it's, it's better than it is worse, you know, it's, it's that side. Um, I think at Love Canal, it would have been a tremendous help. Although I have to say, we were able to do messaging in a way that was just extraordinary. We were able to do it that we could capture the hearts and minds of people all across this country and the world um, because we were very good at that. Um, and we do teach, I mean, so it's not just the venue, it's not social media or, but it's like, what are you saying? And, and I think that's also important. Um, I worked in just recently with a group in Pennsylvania who were anti-frackers. And they're like, stop the fracking, stop the fracking, stop the truck, stop the this, stop the that. And I'm like, you're giving me a headache. What are you guys for? And they said, well, we're for green energy. And I said, let's start with green energy. Um, they only could get 30 people at all their meetings. After they changed their messaging to say, we want green energy, we want to stop the fracking, they had 250 people at that meeting. So, so it's not just the vehicle for the message, but it's the message itself and making it short and simple and catchy and for something as well as against something, that there's that balance so people don't think you're just a raving lunatic out there. Um, 
that's really important. So, so you created the Center for Health, mm -hmm. Environment, and Justice to empower community groups and to provide training. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, what are the, the skills that you try and provide uh, through that training program? Well, one of it is messaging. I mm -hmm. mean, because right. people, local mm -hmm. people don't know how to do messaging. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we work really, really hard with them. I, I, and a funny story is that one group that we were working with around messaging is that they had a hazardous waste landfill and they, they wanted to expand it and the community did not and they fought for eight years and just could not move it. And then we had this conversation with a bunch of community leaders. Well, you know, what are, we, what are you talking about and why isn't it moving? Well, people are worried about property values and they just get a, a huge list of stuff. Um, and, and then somebody said, well, just how dare they do that? I mean, just how dare they? We already took all this waste. How dare they even, and, you know, even suggest we take more? And that was their message, how dare they? Mm. And as a result of doing how dare they, it was a dignity. It wasn't about toxics. It wasn't about health. It wasn't about um, mm. those kind of things. But it was about how dare they? You know, it's a dignity question. We paid our dues to society. And people just, you know, latched on to that and moved forward. Um, the other thing we teach them to do is to, to structure an organization. Most people who structure mm. organizations, structure an organization that looks like a pyramid, looks like corporate America, um, where you have one or two or three people at the top and then all the rest are sort of come out to the meetings, maybe. And how do you structure your organization in a way that people are actually playing a role in the organization and it's not the top three to five people making all the decisions. So structure to do it democratically is critically important. And that was one of the lessons we learned at Love Canal and I have carried. So at Love Canal, for example, we had 50 street reps. So 50 people were in charge of five to 10 houses. And then we would meet once a week and talk about what are you hearing? What are the rumors? What are These people felt so important. They would come in this meeting, well, I talked to my five people and this is what I thought. And you know, I'm, you know it gave people a sense of pride and responsibility and accountability. Um, and so the street captains really were able to, to keep the, the thumb on the pulse of, of the community but they also contributed to the thinking about how do we move forward and what do we do. Those 50 people had votes and voices at the table, so it wasn't your corporate structure where the top five people are making, having all the conversations and making all the decisions. Right. And also, that, you know, when you're putting together an organization, you really want people who don't look, walk, and talk just like you. Um, you know, diversity is important, diversity of class, diversity of sex, diversity of ideas that um, a lot of the groups we go to, they're like, I ask them how they make a decision, and they said, we do it by consensus. I said, really consensus? Nah, we're all friends, you know, Joe says he wants to do it this way, you know, we talk about it and then we do it. It's like, that's not an organization, that's a club. Do you want to start an organization? Because, so, you know, and Joe looks like the other fellas in the room, and Sue looks like the other ladies in the room. Um, so, so it's really important in an organization to have it really represent the community that you that you are um, speaking to and from, um, and that as many people as possible have a role. Nobody wants to be chair of the fundraising committee, unless anybody here want to be chair of the fundraising committee? Because I know there's some. But how many of you would bake a dozen brownies, right? So, so if you can break it down mm -hmm. to tasks, then you have you know, 20 people in this room who'd be willing to bake some brownies to bring to a fundraiser, and the chair is really just the coordinator. I, again, much, much like other leadership, that person should not be doing the work. They should be coordinating and facilitating the work and the conversation. Do you also teach how to use the experts and the expertise? And the yeah, we do. We have a whole, <laughs> we have a whole session on mm -hmm. experts and how to use them and how not to use them. Mm -hmm. Because experts, experts are really unique people, which is essentially anybody who comes from out of the town is an expert, right? Um, well, we have a whole room full of experts here. It's we do. And, and the problem, aspire to be experts. I know. And the <laughs> problem with experts, with all due respect to the room, um, is that they think they know it all. Mm -hmm. And one of the problems is to tell the expert to hush and listen mm -hmm. to the people. Because the people who live in the community know more than any expert, and I don't care how much you studied. Um, and really figure out how you can work with the community, not for the community. And that's the biggest problem with experts is they come in, they want to work for the community. We don't want you to work for us. We want you to work 
with us, and mm -hmm. it's 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 very different. Um, and and then not having the experts speak. So even our lawyers, we don't let them speak. So when the lawyers go to file a a lawsuit about something, they go in the building, they file the lawsuit, and then they come out and hand the paper to the local leader, and the la local leader says, such and such law firm just filed a lawsuit on behalf of our folks for blah, 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 blah. And, and the reason is that experts, and you know, and I put attorneys in that category, then are, are, are voicing the concerns, the issues, and the requests, and the voices of the community when the community is quite capable of doing it themselves. And, and so it's, it's, it's really mm -hmm. hard. Um, and experts who work with our communities, we always say there's, there's three Ds. Um, all our experts will ask for, which I think is an important lesson you can learn, which is digest the information, give me directions, and deadline. So, because we get boxes of stuff otherwise, literally crates of paper and data that somebody's supposed mm -hmm. to look at and we have no clue what, what it is. And, and we give these very simple things because I think it helps the conversation because most community people don't know what they want from you. They just want help. We don't know what you can do. We don't know what right. you can bring to the table. Mm -hmm. Just help us. And, and I think it's the expert's responsibility to sort of unpack that. And, you know, what, what are you looking at? What do you have? What are you concerned about? And, and mm -hmm. Ask questions, all reflective questions, and don't say a definitive word till the third meeting. Try that. It's really hard. It's really hard, but it's important. So what does this community want? Hi, I'm Glenn Stern from the Department of Environmental Health here at the school. And uh, my question is kind of the flip question to what, what the previous question was, which is, how do you feel the role of government has changed over the last 35 years, say, since you started? Um, so you were able to somehow uh, miraculously um, help legislation come through for the Superfund, for um, other kinds of Clean Air Act, those kind of things. Is, the, is government more responsive now, do you think? Less responsive, about the same as it was 35 years? How has it evolved? Our government's definitely less responsive, not only to environment, but to so many things now. I mean, we, we, it's just so polarized, and it's just awful. Um, so I think, it's, I, think it's, I think it's worse. Um, I pretty much know it's worse, actually. But what is, what is interesting, and you see this historically if you look back, is when things get really bad in Washington or the State House, things move local. So, for example, there's a chemical policy reform that's been trying to pass for, you know, 10 years. People have been working on it, and it has gone nowhere. And, and the, the ones who least want it have introduced their bill, which means every chemical is something you should sprinkle on your Wheaties in the morning. Um, and, and so the answer to that was we can keep beating them up in D.C. or we can do something else. So the something else, the strategy that came from that, um, conversation was to do a state strategy. So there are we, safer states is what we call them in our campaign, but there are certain states that have been targeted that are more likely than not to move, to move policy. And when it moves in these various states, it will bubble up to D.C. We saw that actually back in um, the 80s with Right to Know. Right to Know actually started in the workplace. And then the workers moved it to the city level, and then the county level, and then the state level, and then these various states did it. And the industry was going crazy because they were filling out so many forms. And they said, Let, we need a federal policy. This is insane. So we're doing the same with chemical policy around uh, consumer products, primarily in Washington, California, Michigan, Minnesota, Massachusetts, uh, Connecticut. I'm missing some states, but there's, there's 15 safer states. And, and at, just by naming those, you know, they're, they're ones that are more progressive states. Um, once those have been passed, and many of the states have passed lots of different laws, um, then D.C. will come. Because the industry, uh, the ones I've been sitting with lately, has said, Lois, this is insane. I can't sell this in California, but I can sell it in Mississippi, and I can't sell this one in Washington, and we can't keep track of all of this. And it's like, well, clean up your products, and you don't have to worry about it. I mean, it's, there's a simple solution to this. Um, so so that's, I think that's the answer. I mean, I think it's always been the answer. I mean, rarely does something come down 
from D.C. or a state house without a bottoms up push to begin with. But I think that we, because of gridlock and because of what's happened to our upper government, if you will, I think we really need to focus way more energy on local and state and really take care of our own backyard and by everybody doing that, backyard being as big as a state or a region, um, D.C. will come along. I mean, I just think that there's no other way. Do we have another question? Yes. Um, thank you for the talk. It has been very inspiring. Um, I'm a fifth year doctoral student in environmental health, and my name is Wan Chen. So in the past uh, Monday and Tuesday, we just had an event uh, for the Bhopal disaster uh, event series. And we were very lucky to have um, <coughs> the producer to do a, a film producer to do a Q&A and a survivor to be there with us. And we were very shocking to learn that even after 30 years of this disaster, a lot of children there are still being mm -hmm. affected because of contaminated water and then improperly uh, treated soil. Yeah. So their road has been very bumpy and they're still trying very hard to have their voice heard. I'm just curious, um, do, on your journey of Love Canal, mm -hmm. have you ever been into a certain position or times that you really feel you get stuck? and how you get yourself out of that kind of feeling and emotions and start to move forward again. Mm -hmm. And the second question would be, in addition to have passion and compassion, um, is there any good advice that on how we can actually pull influential people together who share this uh, interest and um, passions and then we can actually do something? So I'm very looking Thank forward you. to your answers. Thank, Thank you for that question. So, so um, there is a lot of bumps in the road. I mean, as, as a leader, whether you're a leader in a workplace or whether you're a leader in a community, there is a lot of bumps and there's a lot of stops, a lot of stops. And one of the things I found as a leader, which was a little problematic, is if you're the leader, you can't say we're losing or we're stuck because you're the cheerleader. Leaders are cheerleaders. And, and so what do you do? And you have to find something to do. So what I did, which will be in Tufts University in the archives, is I did a journal. So every time I got stuck, or mostly nightly, because I was learning as I was going along, I would write in that journal, like, I don't think we're going to win, and I can't, I, can't, I can't tell anybody this, and I don't know what to do, and I'm laying on my bed, and I'm crying, and my husband's at work, and the kids are sleeping, and I don't know what to, you know, it's just, just emotions to get the emotions out. Um, but Stuck, stuck is just stuck. You know, it's like you you got to find a way around it. And the way to f get around it is you go hang out with those people again, and say I'm stuck. I know, but you don't say it in a depressing way. You're like, okay, guys, nobody's moving here. They haven't moved in a long time. What are we gonna do? Somebody come up with an idea. I don't care what idea it is. And there's not a bad idea. And then you know, people will start talking, and you may or may not come up with a bad idea. But the fact that you're in a group setting with people who feel the same way you do, who can engage, and they probably sense that you are a little sad and upset and depressed. <laughs> depressed. Oh, I was always depressed. No, I wasn't. Because um, I think, I think a, a leader has to be the cheerleader. You have to be the cheerleader. You have to be the one that says, great job, even though it was mediocre. Um, you're the one who has to you know, really move that stuff forward. And, and I think that that's really important. And then Erica, the, would you like to have the, the last question? I would, actually. Um, just kind of um, I'm Erica. I'm a third-year doctoral student. But just piggybacking off her, her question, if you could just list a few things you could do over again. Like, we heard a lot about your successes, but what about some of your mistakes that maybe we could learn from and save some time? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think, we, I think we made a lot of mistakes, uh, and we don't actually call them mistakes, we call them learnings. So all mistakes are learnings, and if you look at them as a mistake, you probably, um, but, but some, of, some of them were just growing, you know, really believing in the system and really banging your head against the wall, trying to get somebody to understand the study and do the right thing, and really, really thinking that that's the way it's going to work, and it doesn't, I mean, that, it took me a really long time, took us, the bigger me, 
uh, a really long time to overcome that it, because it was so fundamental to what I believed in in my country and my in the way I lived and the way my parents brought me up. Um, the other thing, the other thing I learned is that politicians lie, um, and they only don't lie when you put them in front of a camera. Um, and, 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 and we made that mistake several times where politicians said, if there's, if there's a problem and you could prove there's a problem, we will do the right thing. And so we celebrated. I mean, we just drank wine, champagne all the time, but we really, we really celebrate it, uh, only to find out what they meant by that was nothing, because we couldn't prove anything. And so when elected officials talk, they, they sort of double talk, double speak. And to say, what I've been doing since then is, can you say this? You will evacuate us. If you can't say this, you're not saying anything. And so really, and, and that's a little harsh, and it really wasn't exactly like that, but, but if you want them to say something or give you something, whoever they are, whether they're your boss or the government, you really need to say, this is what we want, and we want you to give it to us. And when they say blah, 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 it's like, I don't know what that means. Did you say this? No, I didn't say that. What I said, and you can dig deeper to find out what's behind what they're saying, because um, that would have saved us a lot of times, because we truly believed, and many communities believe, that they've won when, in fact, all they got was double talk. Um, and the other thing I would, that I think is really important is that you need to take your time. Your time meaning your personal time. So what I teach leaders to do is take your calendar out for the year and mark a weekend every month and call that weekend Laundry Day. And that is a weekend that's for you. You can do whatever you want. If you want to do laundry, Godspeed, but you can do whatever you want. Because if you put going to the movies with friends and somebody in your leadership comes up and says, we really need you at this meeting. Oh, I already made an appointment to go with my friends to see this film. Oh, you can see it another time, right? If you say, I got to do laundry, they're like, got it. And they walk <laughs> away, right? So, so that's, why, that's why you use the word laundry. And, and really take the time, do something for yourself, whether it's a gym or running or, you know, whatever it might be, that, it, that this is hard work. And, you know, when we, when we talk about, we're sort of nearing the end here, mm. when, when, we, when you talk about leadership, it takes a lot of energy. And I don't mean energy doing stacking books and stuff, but Every time you stand up in front of somebody that you're speaking out to or up to, or it wipes you out. It's an emotional drain. It's a lot of energy. The stress of doing this, if you're a scientist and you're going to present a study and there's those other people who are going to rip it apart because it's too financially expensive if you're right, or whatever the motivation is, they're going to rip it apart. That's so hard. Don't take it personally. It's not about you. It's not about you. It's about something way bigger than you. You're just the pawn in front of them. To really think about, and what I say is when they're ripping my stuff apart, it's like I just imagine them there ripping it apart on the toilet seat. You know, he's going to use it so that it sort of <laughs> brings them down to a level where, where I can sort of deal with that and, and find coping things to deal with that as well. Um, and, and I, you know, leadership is really about courage. I mean, I, I was saying to uh, Doug that when I think about leadership, you really should think about The Wizard of Oz, other than being a great movie, is, is that, the, you know, it was, it was about courage. You know, they had, they had the brains, they had the heart, right, when they went to The Great Wizard. But what they really needed to get there, to get all those pieces together so Dorothy could go home, was the courage and understanding of what home is. And I think that that's a really, it's an important movie when you go back and look at it again and think about it, um, that, that I think it's really, it's really important. And I think, I think one of the other takeaways what we teach in leadership is try not to make a decision. If you're a leader, you're leading people. You're not deciding where to go. You're leading people, but the vision of where you're going and how you're going to get there 
if you're really working with a team or working with a community, has to be a collective decision, even though it's not actually voted on, that the more often you can deflect the decision to other people on your team or other people in your community, the more likely you are to have an extraordinarily strong team or strong community group. Leaders lead. They don't decide where to go. They just help lead. And then the last thing I'll say, which is what I enjoy most about community organizing, is celebrate every victory, literally. When the governor called us back, we opened champagne. I mean, that's, that's powerful. Governor's calling, you know, this little community. Uh, celebrate every victory in, with your team. You know, you could just get, you know, juice and cookies or something or beer and wine, which is my preference, and, and sit down and say, you know, we're moving. We got that news article in the paper today. That was huge, and we want to thank everybody who helped make that happen. Because people only want to be on a team that's winning. They want a team that's, that's, that's fun. They want a team that's also social. Most of organizing and leadership is about creating the social environment that wants people to come back. Lois, that's wonderful. You're really an inspirational speaker. You've, uh, thank you for sharing your journey with us. Thank you for sharing your experiences with us yeah. and uh, your extraordinary teacher as well as an extraordinary leader. So thank, thank you. you very much. So we want to uh, close this. I want to thank the audience also for your participation today and, and your questions. And we look forward actually to seeing you next week on April 17th. We have Dr. Anthony Fauci, the director of the National Institute of Aging and Infectious Disease, who, who would be presenting at the next Voices Symposium. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me.